close enough. Let's go. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I mean, a couple of months ago, when was the news article in the paper? In February or so? I think it was maybe April. Or yeah, March, I think so too. Like a few months ago in the Press Democrat, I read an article about a young woman who was in a bad accident uh, when she was 22 and lost her uh, two of her legs and the use of one arm. And how she has, and the article continued to explain how she hated being dependent. And so she just figured out how to be independent. <laughs> and even though she's classified as having disabilities or being disabled, she wasn't. She's just working a in a different way. And that's Inga today. Inga Liz Liz Danita. Is that right? Good. Okay, good. And today she coaches others with disabilities. She is a staff member of the Santa Rosa Disability Services and Legal Center, and she's writing a book. So it's an auto part autobiography, part self-help, and also explains her testimony to her faith. The title of her book is Unstoppable, and that's such a good title for this young woman here. It's also, that is also the name of her presentation tonight. She is indeed an unstoppable person and will be inspiring to hear. So I hope that you'll welcome with me Inga and hear what she has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno, for such a nice, well, a nice welcoming message. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening to everybody, every single one of you. I appreciate you coming here. And I do hope that uh, you will leave this room a little bit different. That you will be inspired to deal with your challenges. And maybe you will hear some of the things that you can implement into, in your own life. Uh, to win the game. That's how we look at life. I'm going to be the winner. I'm not going to allow anybody to uh, defeat me and make me sit and cry, right? So I'm the one who is going to overcome. And by now you already um, probably heard that I have an accent, right? And probably you are thinking, where in the world is she from? <laughs> Uh, English is my third language. Um, I'm from Lithuania. It's Eastern Europe. Uh, we border with Poland, Russia, Baltic Sea. We are only a couple hours flight from Germany, Great Britain. So we are in that area. Uh, we are a very small country, but tough one. Uh, one of the things that um, we kind of know, if I can call it that way, we broke Soviet Union. We are the ones who broke off from the Soviet Empire in 1990, and that was the beginning of its fall. So um, I, I come from a tough, tough nation. <laughs> and uh, English is my third language. My, uh, my first language is my native uh, Lithuanian. It's one of the oldest languages in the world and most difficult to learn. And then Russian. Uh, as my, it's like my native language and then English. Actually, American English is like the fourth language because <laughs> Americans don't speak in English. You have, you have your own language. I, I was one of the highest uh, graded students uh, in a high school for English and I thought I knew it so when I came to the United States and I did not understand people at all. <laughs> Seriously, it took me three months to finally stop asking people to repeat themselves in order for me to understand them. Uh, so <laughs> it was quite a journey. Uh, you know, from, uh, because I was able, um, my journey trans transforming my life from the moment when I was completely hopeless, completely helpless, to transforming my life to by to traveling across the globe literally and rebuilding my life all over again and uh, living a joyous life, dynamic life, regardless of my uh, physical challenges. 
that journey inspired me. It gave me the passion to pass on my journey, to pass on the tools that empowered me. So anybody can take it and, and use it. So I hope that today, in the given time that I, that I have, I will be able to, to share and inspire you. I guess you are thinking, how in the world did she get from, <laughs> from Lithuania all the way right to here? And that's the story. Well, I lived a very good life. My dad was a pilot and then security director at the Vilnius International Airport. My mom was a kindergarten and she's still a kindergarten teacher. I have a, a three years older brother and um, we lived a very good life. I, I worked as a manager of the business lounge of the Vilnius International Airport. I led a very dynamic, active uh, lifestyle, lots of friends, great job, everything. I did not lack of anything. Until one day when my life turns around completely. When I was 22 years old, I woke up in the intensive care unit, hooked up to a life support machine fighting for my life. I could not even, I still remember that feeling, how the oxygen was coming in and coming out of my lungs, and I didn't understand why do I not have to make the effort to breathe, it just comes into my lungs. Apparently that was life support machine, that was breathing for me. Soon I found out that in the middle of the fun night, uh, in the midst of having fun with my uh, boyfriend, uh, while we were driving 100 miles an hour on the icy road down the hill in the city, at that speed we hit the light pole. Can you imagine 100 miles an hour down the hill we hit the light pole? The car broke, literally broke into two pieces. I saw the video later on. I could not sleep for I don't know how many nights after that. And I saw myself being taken out of the car without my legs. Some parts of the car, they, they cut, cut them off right there in the car. They rescued me, barely survived, uh, barely uh, alive. On the way to the hospital, uh, my heart has stopped. And then they, they returned me back to life and they hooked, it, hooked me up in the intensive care unit giving me 30% chances to survive. Basically, they said, uh, no chances, uh, you better go and pray. So my family and all my friends, they, they prayed for me literally uh, because I was on the verge of death, actually the second time while I was in ICU. My boyfriend, however, did not get this chance. He was killed instantly, he was ejected out of the car and he was instantly uh, killed instantly right there on the spot. And with time, I was finding out my uh, traumas. You know, there were news about my traumas were kind of bombarding me. Uh, the severe head injury that um, ended up with a pretty bad memory loss. I had a neck injury that nearly got broken. My right hand was severely broken. The left hand is paralyzed, so I have only one functional arm after all. My ribs were broken, uh, fully jaw completely smashed. Uh, lungs were um, had full of uh, blood, so I, I, I had a hard time breathing and I lost my legs. And so here I am. I returned back from the hospital at the age of 22 when it seems like my life has to be blossoming and building, you know, flourishing life. I end up in a complete, dark, endless nightmare. I come into my room, roll into the room. I did not want to get into the wheelchair. My parents hardly um, talked me into it. Uh, and I look at my pictures and I see I will never be the same. And everything that I experienced before, I will never experience that again. Everything that made my life joyous and beautiful and satisfying and fulfilling, everything was taken away from me. And on top of that, I did not have my legs to stand up and go anywhere I wanted. Even to a simple thing like restroom, I had to ask for help every single time I wanted to go 
to the bathroom, I wanted to go take a shower, or I wanted to eat, I wanted to, I could not even roll over in the bed or sit up from the lying position. That's how injured I was. It was not always that pretty as uh, people see t today, me zipping around the city all over, right? I, I started my journey from a very, very dark place. I cannot even describe you the anguish that, that I had to face when going from fulfilling, active, beautiful life overnight, I enter in the, into the world that I never knew. And the city was not accessible, so all year round, for three years, I was basically imprisoned in my own home. I could not even get out of my room for a long time because the doorways were too narrow. And you know, the, uh, there were many opinions about, uh, you know, about this accident, and so I heard the, the opinions that such as your destiny, you poor little thing, such a beautiful girl, and uh, such a crash. I heard that God has punished me uh, in such a way. I also heard that, um, well, he broke her destiny. And you know, I am very rebellious by nature. And plus, I was empowered greatly by faith. And I said, you know what? That is not my destiny. I am going to create the destiny that I want. But I'm not going to live this destiny broken. I'm not going to blame God. I'm not going to blame my boyfriend. I'm not going to blame the event or destiny or whoever. That was my own choice that I made to get into that car and go with him that night. And I take the responsibility for that part. And I know that with God's help, I will be able to do it. It was still very difficult for me to face the physical challenges because not to be able suddenly to lose your legs, that is trauma that I, I cannot even describe. I don't know how to even describe the, the, the anguish what it looks like to lose your legs and not be able to to go and, and be you know independent uh, plus my arm one arm is also is a big challenge and plus i have constant sharp burning ongoing pain all the time there's not even one second i would not be in pain up to this day all 15 years every single one second i have the sharp burning pain and I thought I would go insane, literally. And, you know, and it was very difficult for me to, to handle the loss. I had a lot of trouble dealing with it. And I kept asking, you know, God, why so cruel? Why, why, why me? Why, why is this happening? Where were you, Lord? Where were you when I was in the car, when we hit that light pole? Why, why everything happened that way? And you know, one day when I was in the, in the rehab center, amazing thing happened. Uh, my um, uh, massage therapist, she comes in and she says, Inga, do you know that you were born under, lucky, under the lucky star? And I'm like, really? <laughs> I actually, I think I was born under the two lucky stars. Not just one, let me tell you about it. And she was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I just looked at your x-rays of your skull and, and spine cord, and um, your neck was nearly broken. Uh, I don't know how you call that, a cer cervical, um, what's the? Cervical vertebrae. Yeah, probably, I cannot pronounce that, <laughs> it's too difficult. Yeah, yeah, that little bone that that, that, that consists of. She said it was actually um, uh, not broken, but nearly broken. And she said, if you had turned your head a little bit stronger, uh, a little bit different angle, you would be paralyzed up to your neck without ability to move your body, to move your hand, nothing. You would be just lying and move only your eyes. That was it. And she said, you don't understand what a miracle it is that you not only survive, but you actually can move. And I'm sitting there, and even now shivers go through my body as I'm sharing this, and I remember that moment, understanding, God, you were watching over me. I did not die, which is unbelievable. 
and then that I actually move. And then on the next day or so, I meet a young man in the wheelchair outside, and he was beaten up by some gang, and he got the brain injury thing, and he was not able to move. He was fully paralyzed. He could not, he barely could even speak. And uh, he could not move his arms. He had full, you know, body, legs, and arms, but he could not move them. And as I'm talking to them, I have this little voice, um, I don't know, whispering to me, Inga, this is, this is what you could be. This is what, uh, what you could have been. And you know, that moment when my mom and I were walking, I was, I was just so shocked. So I can actually, I'm so thankful that it ended up to be that way, that I can move. I have that one hand that I can actually learn to do things. I can learn to do things with one hand. The most important thing that I have it. I have a clear mind. So I can think straight. I can speak. I can move my body. Yes, I don't have legs, but I can, I, I can get the prosthesis or move in the wheelchair, but I didn't even want to think about the wheelchair. I, I was into prosthesis. So I will learn to walk. I will learn what to do with one hand, how to take care of things. I can think, I can, I can speak, I can communicate. I'm sharp, so I can actually live my life. And you know, that moment, that was a turning point for me, understanding that I need to pay attention, not what I have lost, not what I cannot do anymore, but what I have, and then what I can do with what I have. And that's why I say that it's not, it's what you have and what you do with what you've got. That's what makes a difference. So I encourage you by sharing this particular message, I want to encourage you, pay attention what you've got. You've got a lot. Believe me, you've got a lot and do work with what you got, and you will be so blessed. That's the thing that I, I know that you most likely you've seen people who are more um, injured and more limited than you are. That moment to me that just totally, I, that was the moment when I decided, you know what? With God's help, I am going to change my life. And I started my journey. So when I was learning to learn how to do things, instead of paying attention, oh, I don't have legs, or, well, what can you do with one hand, right? And I'm calling for help. I intentionally, I refused for help in the rehab center. I did not, I was sitting there for a long time trying to figure out how to do the sandwich, how to slice, you know, things with one hand, how to slice bread, how to slice meat, how to slice vegetables and everything with one hand. And I thought, I'm not going to have breakfast until I will make it happen. And I didn't. And because I so wanted to be independent, I hated with passion to ask for people to have them do everything for me. I couldn't stand it. And so that anger, I turned into determination to make a difference. So I thought, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna learn how to do it myself. So instead of asking, can I do this? Automatically would be no, because nobody makes sandwich with one hand. Nobody dresses up with one hand. I was asking myself how to. Remember this question, when you have a challenge, how to. When, when I start asking myself how to, how can I make the sandwich with one hand? How can I dress up? How can I, I'm sorry for this intimate thing, how can I um, dress up the bra with one hand? Yeah. <laughs> right? Actually, I tell you, German physical therapists came to me asking me for suggestions to show them, to explain to them how, so they could tell their clients in Germany. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I know. So, asking question, how can I, greatly empowered me throughout my life. I never ask myself, can I do this? Because depending on the situation or circumstance or you know, my physical ability uh, condition, many times I would have the answer, immediate answer, no. And then what do you do? You are back dependent on somebody else. So all my life I'm fighting for the, my independence and I rarely, thank God now, I rarely have to ask for help. I live 
on my own, having no caregivers. I take, uh, take care of my household by myself, shopping, anything. Just anything that you do, cooking, shopping, cleaning, um, anything I do on my own. I don't ask for help because I was determined to find a way until I find a way. I don't, I don't give up until I find a way, period with no, no consideration of, of other alternative. And until I find it, I'm committed and I do it. <sighs> Where I was in the rehab center, right? So after I got back, so this way I, I learned to, uh, on a daily basis, to become more and more independent from my uh, mom, from my family. And then immediately I went to the prosthetic rehab center where makes prosthesis, prosthetic legs. And when I came in there, professor looked at me and then looked at the papers at all the injuries that I've got. And then he says, how, how is your arm? I said, well, you know, it doesn't work. The only sign that it's alive is that I feel pain. And he's like, well, can you use it? I said, no. And he again looked back into papers at me and he says, Professor says it's impossible for you to walk. We cannot make them. And I'm looking at him like, what do you mean it's impossible? And he says, well, your physical condition is too complicated. Maybe wait until your arm, left arm will recover. And I just felt the storm within me is like, wait, are you serious? How do I know when it's going to recover? If it's going to recover? I said, I am going to come back to you on Monday. Please make me legs. Or the professor was quite shocked. By it. I said, how can you tell me it's impossible if you have not tried it? I mean, seriously, how can you tell me you cannot do it? You haven't worked with me. You don't know. So don't tell me what's possible, what's not, by reading the theory. So he said, he was quite, yeah, astonished. And he said, okay, come back and we'll make your legs. I came back and I spent there uh, about two years learning. It was, it was so difficult, I cannot even describe you, and painful beyond the word what pain conveys. It's, it was unbelievable. Um, but I did learn to walk. If the whole center was looking at me with big eyes, how can she possibly do it? I walked right before the eyes and I, and I ascended the center stairs. However, after two years, I still realized that with those prosthesis, I would not be able to live the way I wanted because my dream was to come back to the airport to live. I wanted dynamic life, right? And so, because it was so painful that I could not, I could not wear prosthesis more than 45 minutes or an hour. I just could not simply physically because prosthesis would cut my legs, would cut the tissues, and uh, I would... Having, I would be having bruises and sores and I would put the plaster on it and then again go and stand up. It was a nightmare. So after two years realizing I, again I was, you know, in quite depressed state and I could not understand how can I, how can I rebuild my life? How can I do this when these prostheses don't work? And you know there was a sunny day which I'm so thankful for. There was one sunny day when I was thinking, you know what? This car accident and the circumstances that I have in my life, they were created by event, by the car accident, right? So I can change the circumstances by taking action and changing them deliberately. So I will work and I will make sure these circumstances will change. I am not sitting here and waiting for a miracle to happen. I have to do something. And then I was praying, I said, Lord, uh, how do I do this? How, I, I believe you. I believe you are going to give me life, just as you promised. Um, I forgot to say early in the Bible, reading the Bible, I received um, a message to me uh, that the Lord was going to restore my life. And I so believed it, I so believed that, that I, I took it strongly into my heart and I knew, I knew this was going to be restored. My life was going to be restored. And then one day, I'm sitting and, and uh, thinking about everything and I get this thought, go on the internet and look for help worldwide. 
I go on the internet and look for help worldwide. And I did not, to be honest, I didn't even know what to look for. I didn't know English that well. I had no idea. And prosthetic subject has many terminology that even English-speaking person will hardly understand. So I spent countless hours searching, countless, with dictionary, translating every other word, trying to grasp what they're talking about. And then uh, one night I emailed to three companies. And then on the next day, I received a response from the owner and prosthetic specialist from Santa Rosa, California. <laughs> And he was very interested in helping me. And so we started emailing back and forth. And after two weeks, uh, he says, Inga, I am sc I'm scheduled to give a prosthetic training in Turkey. So if you would travel to Istanbul to meet me, um, I would evaluate you and your prosthetic legs. What's wrong with them? And you know, I did not think too much. I knew that was the answer to my prayer. And I, I went to my room and I said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to Turkey. <laughs> Can you imagine their reaction? <laughs> and they looked at me, to Turkey, you, going to Turkey, really? So I explained to them everything, and so they let me go. And so I took my girlfriend and my prosthesis, and my friends actually, they looked at me as if I was insane, literally. Go to Turkey, to a country like Turkey, to meet some American man whom you don't know. And my brother, particularly, he's like, oh, okay, and so, after he is going to give you hope again, he's going to go back to his beautiful sunny California. And what you're going to do, you're going to sit here with all your dreams alone, and then what? And so there was a whisper of fear of disappointment. Uh, but then I thought, you know, this is my chance. And I cannot let go because I'm afraid of being disappointed. I will go and then we'll take it from there. So I traveled to Turkey. I traveled to Turkey, I meet John, and then there he spent several hours one day and he adjusted my prosthesis and um, um, I, that was the first time in two years I stood up having no pain. I screamed out of pain literally in the room with all the specialists there and they could not believe it. I cried for the rest of the day literally, like a baby, because for two years by prosthetic specialists and professors, I was told you will never be able to walk. You will never be able to do this. This is supposed to hurt. This is how it has to be. And here, this man, in several hours, he does this miracle. I don't feel pain. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, <laughs> I returned back and I went to that prosthetics uh, facility and I told them the story. And then they invited John uh, to give the lecture in Lithuania. So John traveled to Lithuania in the half of the year. And then he invites me to California. He says, Inga, I will make you legs myself. Come as a donation. Do you need a bigger miracle? <laughs> Those... I have many miracles in my life, but this was the first one, besides the fact that I survived. Those prosthesis cost over $40,000, just parts, besides the work, besides the time and, and everything else. And so he invites me to California, and I don't think too much as well, uh, again, and I say, Mom, Dad, I'm going to America. So, in this way, in 2003, February, I travel independently across the globe and I land in San Francisco airport and I come to Sonoma County and I fell in love with this county immediately. I am a palm tree lover. And so as soon as I, and, 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 and particularly, uh, the, it, it was harsh winter at the time. And so I came to the airport with a fur coat and then I changed my clothes at the airport, got into the airplane, and got out here, and I was hot. And I couldn't believe it. So for me, it was like a fairy tale. So I spent here six months, and we worked extremely, extremely hard. It was strenuous exertion every single day. It was very, very difficult. However, I implement my dream. In six months, I returned back to Europe walking again. I, hang, I hug my mom at the airport standing. 
That was my dream that I dreamed all those months, all those nights and days, to be able to hug my mom standing. And it was my biggest accomplishment, impossible, when I heard so many times, you cannot do it, it cannot be done. I did it, and I returned to that center, and I did everything that they told me I cannot do. I walked before them, I sat down and stand up independently, which they told me it's impossible, and I even danced before their eyes to show them that you cannot tell anybody, don't ever tell anybody what's possible, even if you graduated from whatever. Because really, the human, the hard work, when you, and when you really, really, really desire something, not just a wish, you know, but desire strongly, have a burning desire. If you have unshakable faith, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. When you truly believe and you work hard, you can achieve anything you want, anything you want. So I celebrated for a while, and then I realized the, the climate, we have four seasons in Lithuania. In the in a, in a winter, I, will, I cannot walk with prosthesis. And then I kept remember, and you know, the accessibility of the city is not accessible, it was not at the time, it was not accessible. So even having prosthesis was not a good thing. Didn't, uh, I was not able to fulfill a dynamic, active lifestyle as I wanted. Plus, for me, in my physical condition, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. It's, it's a hard, hard job to walk with prosthesis. And I kept remembering Sonoma County. I kept remembering Sonoma County, how I was seeing here, how people with disabilities here can, you know, roll around the city and, and receive any services they desire and be as independent as they desire and have no obstacles, no, you know, environments uh, protect, uh, preventing them from, from, you know, getting to places whatever they want. And again, empowered by my faith, I said, I am going to move there. It was a tough decision because at the time I did not have a place to live. I did not have a lot of money. I did not have a job. And I didn't even have the permission to live and work in America. Plus, I'm in this wheelchair with one hand. How am I going to do it? And still, I had a strong faith that if I have achieved so far, and I saw that with God, with God's help, I, I can do anything. If I really desire and work hard, with God there is nothing impossible with Him. And I go to the room, and guess what I tell them now? I said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to America to live, not just visit, to live. They, they, of course, they were emotional, but then I explained to them, you know, how and why. And I pack my luggage. I tell my American friends that I'm coming back. And they, of course, they asked, you know, Inga, how? Where are you going to live? How are you, how you going to survive in here? And I said, I don't know. I will get to know when I get there. That's when I will know, you know, how to. Because now I don't. Sitting here at home, I will not be able to. So I get the ticket and I return back to California in 2004 to Sonoma County and I stayed at Flamingo Hotel because I was homeless, if I can call it that way. And before I, I um, went, before I flew, I um, did the research of a variety of resources um, that help people with disabilities uh, here in Sonoma County and overall in California. And the first uh, organization where I went uh, seeking for help was Disability Services and Legal Center. And this is the place where I work now as public relations uh, person for that agency. I never left them. So uh, when I arrived, um, I set the goals one after another and I continuously was working. I'm a hard worker, I'm a worker bee. Um, and in a few years, I implemented my impossible dream. Today already, it's been, it, it's the 10th year. This year, it's, it's been 10 years, a decade. I live here in Sonoma County as if I don't have disability. As I mentioned before, I 
do not like to ask for help and even Donna now tasted that a little bit when she asked if she can roll me, you know, in the wheelchair and I said, no, I'm fine, that's okay. <laughs> because uh, that's just how I am. It's not disrespect to people who want to help me, it's just, that's just how I am. I live independently on my own, I work, I travel, I have countless friends. I live as I don't have a disability and actually I'm happier than I was before the car accident. Truly, sincerely, I say that. Truly, sincerely. Regardless of the fact that only one hand is, you know, alive, so to speak, and the other one gives me the sign that it's alive by giving me pain. <laughs> you know, I am truly happy and I share my message to, um, with everybody that, look, it's not what happens to us what determines the quality of our life, but it's what we do with what happens. Many times people ask me, when they look at my life, they wonder, what does it take to rebuild life from being so hopeless, so helpless, so desperate, to traveling across the globe and living the life as nothing happened? And you know, there are many things, there are many things that come in that, and I will share, I still have time, so I will share that with you. First of all, it's a choice. It's a choice. I made a different choice when I faced the challenge. A lot of times people don't think about the future when the problems hit them, when the challenges hit them. They don't think about the future. They most of the time, a person, and it's natural to a person, focuses on the problem and he is focused right now on what's going on right now, focused on how painful it is, how difficult it is, how horrible, how hopeless. And then sometimes people get into the victim shoes, trying to get, you know, uh, attention to, from other people to get the comfort. That's normal, almost usual formula. I took a different way. I made the choice not to get the sympathy from people. I made the choice to believe. Even though my circumstances were absolutely desperate, there was no way my life could be possibly improved. I still believed that there must be a way, that God is all powerful and everything, if he created the universe, can he create different circumstances for my life? Yes, he can. So with God, everything is possible. I chose to believe that. I chose to focus on what I have instead of what I don't have. I chose to focus on what I can do having no legs and one hand instead of focusing on, well, I have only one hand, so what else can, what can be done? I can ask somebody else. I chose to do it, to find a way. I chose to be resilient, no matter how difficult and painful that was. I chose relentless work. It didn't matter how hard it was. I never questioned myself whether I will have to ask to work, uh, whether I will have to work hard. I never, ever questioned that, ever. If I have to work hard, I will. And that's why when, before I, when I decided to move to the United States, that was my rule for myself. I will work as much as I have to. It doesn't matter how hard I will. And I, and I did. I really did. It took a lot of work. It's a choice to never give up. It's a choice to never give up. Never. You know what helped me is the alternative. Like, what alternative do I have? Okay, I, I feel like I'm about to give up. What alternative do I have? If I give up, then what? What do I have? What you got if you give up? It's definitely not going to make your life better. It's definitely not going to make your life easier. And it's definitely not going to make you feel better about yourself because unconsciously you will know that it's you who gave up. It's you who made the closure. Maybe your victory, your resolution was right around the corner, but you are the one who chose to not look, not take a peek. What is that around the corner? 
So it's a choice, always remember, in any given situation, we cannot control the circumstances, what's going on around us. We cannot do that. But we can control our response, uh, how we respond to what happens. Then, as I told to Donna, there are three components that, that uh, come into what empowered me, and they cannot be separated. I don't separate them. First of all, it's faith. I know that in the community, the, it's a very sensitive topic, uh, faith, but I will, I'm compelled to share that with you, and then what you're going to do with it, it's, it's you're going to be choice, right? Again, it comes back to a choice, right? My rock and, and the strength, a lot of times people say, Inga, you are so strong, where do you get it? It's not natural to me. First of all, problems, they either break you or make you stronger, right? So I chose to be stronger. And then, really, uh, where, that get, where that strength comes from is my faith. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he is my rock. I had a supernatural, um, unexplainable, well, if I can call it that way, when I was on the verge of death, I felt the presence of Jesus Christ right in front of me. And I tell you, there is no such love on the planet like Jesus Christ. There, I, I cannot even describe you his love and his grace. I will, I never, I tell you, I've never been happier than when I was on the verge of death, when Christ was standing in front of me. I never even once was happier. And I tell you, I was healing so fast, the doctors could not explain it scientifically. When they brought me with all the injuries that I told you, with torn off legs, with losing blood, dying literally, they let me go out of the hospital after a month and a half. With makeup on, <laughs> with ready to lead my life, <laughs> to, to lead my life. You know, and I have countless, countless testimonies where my prayers were answered in the name of Jesus Christ. And even now, I am experiencing a miraculous healing after the prayer. I, I was suffering from the phantom pain, uh, which is pain in my feet, which are not there, but I feel them and I felt pain, shooting pain. Uh, for five years, every single day, there was not even one day I would not feel the pain. And it was so torturing. I was drugged uh, because there was no other way to deal with it. And um, one day at the church, um, um, the, the people in the group were inspired to pray for me for the healing. And we prayed. And after that prayer, I, uh, I, those pain shots that I used to have, they're very rare. They're very rare. I decreased my pills double from eight to four, and now I'm decreasing to two because it's narcotic drugs, so you have to slowly cut down. I'm getting freedom from pain. I'm getting freedom from everything. My life is full of testimonies, and that is my strength because when I did not have the strength to, to live, I tell you, there were so many days when I did not want another day to come, really. There were so many days when I cried and I was in such despair, I could not take on anymore. And I prayed. You know, have you been in a, in a place in your life when you just, you have nowhere to go and you just seek already for God, where are you? Talk to me. That's what happened to me. And you know, he was there. He answered to all my prayers and he did restore my life just as he promised me through the Bible. And so that is my first, my first number one strength, is the prayer. I literally receive strength in the prayer and reading the Bible, literally. When there were so many times I did not want to wake up in the morning, I did not have the strength, I prayed, and I, and I got down, got off my knees, of my heart much stronger. Or I would wake up in the morning wanting to live, wanting to fight for my life, wanting... Uh, to, to do, you know, whatever I have to do. That is my strength. That's where I go for the inner strength. Uh, to walk the path that I do demands, requires a lot of inner endurance. And I would not be able to have, I would not have gone this path the way I did if I did not have Christ in my life. Truly, sincerely, I say that. It's not like I'm a hero. I get down on the knees of my heart. And that's where I get my strength. So that's number one. Then the number two is the self-management. 
What's the self-management? It's the ability to respond and ability to control your own emotions. Um, it's choosing the perspective, the powering perspective. Many people thought it's the end of my life. And I said, it's not the end of my life, it's the beginning of my life. Um, it's how you look at the situation. That's what makes a difference. Then, what do you focus on? And again, I will go back to the focus. I always make the effort to focus on what I can do, what I have, what is beautiful in my life, because you experience that which you focus on. If you're gonna focus on how bad everything is and how painful it is and how you cannot do things, that's what you're gonna experience in your life. And you are not going to be excited one, no. So the more you focus on the, on the, on the positive, on, on your you know, power, the better it will be. Then, uh, what do I have here? Yes, cut painful memorizing too. Uh, a lot of times people get drowned into memories, past memories of what had happened to them. And that is a big, 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 big thing. That's what kept me in the depression. I was deeply depressed for three years, deeply. I, w I envied my boyfriend who was killed, that he did not have to go through the torture and agony that I went through. And I was going back to my memories, memorizing my beautiful life or what I have lost, everything. Cut down your memories that give you uh, the pain. And then ask yourself empowering questions. Again, I will go back to, can I? Mm -mm. How can I? Ask yourself the questions that will empower you, that will make you stronger. And always know that, yes, the variety of events are going to happen in your life, but they cannot possibly uh, control, cannot possibly determine the quality of your life. It's up to you. It's going to be your choice, what you're going to focus on and what you're going to do about it. Okay? So be strong. Be determined and persistent, and be unstoppable. When my book is going to come out, I'm pretty sure you will know. Okay, so I will end my story here. It's 8 o'clock. I hope I was not too long. If you have any questions.